Hello, my name is Adrian Charles with University Mission and Ministry, and I'm here at Albert School of Theology to speak with Father Kenneth Hannon about the season of Lent. What is Lent? Historically, it's a little difficult to establish exactly how Lent, as we now have it, uh, developed. There are at least two sources. The first source is the practice of the catechumenate, by which Christians were prepared for baptism and, and anointing in the Spirit and inclusion in the Eucharist. During that period, right before the Easter Vigil, when they would have been initiated fully, it was expected that not only the, the candidates for baptism, but also their sponsors and the ministers who would participate and as many members of the congregation as could, would join them in their preparation. They did this in particular by fasting with them. At the very beginning, they were expected to fast. And that fast was meant to be a kind of, a kind of sloughing off of everything that's old so as to prepare completely new for the baptismal bath and sealing in the spirit. That continued for quite a long time, but obviously we hadn't we hadn't yet appropriated the full three days of, of what we now know as the Easter Triduum. At that point we only had the vigil service and the Easter morning mass at which the candidates were communicated for the first time. Gradually, as we elaborated the the Triduum and as we pushed the time of preparation and made it longer and longer, uh, we eventually came to the point of a 40-day preparation for Easter. Before that, though, however, we had already celebrated the 50 days that go after Easter all the way till Pentecost, which for the newly baptized people was a time of ongoing catechesis. So what we really have is a 90-day period, 40 days of preparation, characterized by penance, but also by hearing the word and by catechesis and by moral training, then the sacraments of initiation, and then the appropriation of the meaning of those sacraments, especially by the newly baptized, but also by the others. So that's really where Lent comes from. The thing is that by the fifth century, the practice of baptizing adults was beginning to wane because we had already begun developing the practice of baptizing infants, so there weren't that many adults to baptize. In this process someplace, and it's very hard to pinpoint because things didn't happen in all the churches at the same time, in this process there began to develop a theology and a spirituality of preparing for Easter by way of repenting your own failings and sins and seeking to kind of retrieve your baptismal innocence. And so the whole community began observing more and more penitential practices throughout that period prior to Easter, so as to be ready to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. So we have, we have both of those practices. One is the preparation for baptism, and the other is the kind of the, the regeneration and repurification of the community in anticipation of the great feast of Easter. What is the meaning of the imposition of ashes? The imposition of ashes actually originates in Hebrew spirituality, and we've heard about it. We hear about, in, in the Old Testament readings, we often hear about wearing sackcloth and ashes. That was a sign of mourning in the first place, but also of repentance. It became characteristic that when someone had to be expelled from communion because of some very grievous sin, that they would be put out of the church ceremonially and they would be expected to dress in sackcloth and then ashes would be strewn on top of their head as a sign of their grief over their sin and also of their commitment to repentance. You can see how easily that practice finds its way then and eventually spreads itself out to all of the members. The early church understood that when someone was undergoing canonical penance, for which they would have been expelled, that the whole church had responsibility to support them by their prayer and by their almsgiving and by their ordinary fasting. And so gradually, gradually, 
we began to impose ashes on one another, uh, even though we weren't formally or canonically penitents. And that practice then was, was, was attached to the beginning of the Lenten observance, which originally started with what we call the first Sunday of Lent, but then gradually found its, back, its way back to Wednesday when we imposed the ashes. The ashes are in the formula meant to remind us that we are, as human, we are expected not only to die, but to face uh, hardship and even illness and sadness in our lives, and that we are to be strong in facing that and to participate by means of our own sufferings in the Lord's suffering so as to celebrate his resurrection at the end of the season. So we begin that thing as a kind of a reminder of who we are and where we're going and what job we have to do in, in our own ongoing conversion. How do you fast during Lent? The earliest use of fasting tended to be a water and bread fasting. That's the kind of the classical form. Uh, gradually over time though it's become the practice in the Catholic Church to fast, and in doing that, not so much the radical fast of bread and water only, but rather reducing the amount that one that one eats uh, in the course of the day. And so the, the kind of the classical rubric was that a Catholic who is fasting would have one principal meal, and the other two meals of the day would together equal that principal meal. So one main meal and two quite small meals. The idea being, of course, like all fasting, to heighten your awareness. You know that that's what happens when you become very, very hungry. All your nerve endings get very sensitive. You're more sensitive to noise, to light. But that physiological process is meant to have, in our practice, a spiritual uh, equivalent of becoming more and more sensitive to our spiritual life and to the possibilities of, by closer focus, of seeking our conversion more deeply. During Lent, we have many processions um, for the receiving of ashes, communion, Palm Sunday. What are the meanings of all of these processions that we have? Each procession in our liturgy has its own particular meaning, which can be found only when you look at the specific liturgy that it occurs within. But in general, processions always have something of a sense of a journey, a kind of a pilgrimage, in which we always together because processions are always common acts, you can't do a procession by yourself. So you gather a group of people and together you go with them towards some goal. The goal finally for Christians and in Catholic liturgy is always to become part of the Paschal Mystery of Christ in one dimension or another. So we join together. So the first thing about the procession is it brings us together as a community. Secondly, we go together towards something. And what we're going towards finally is God and grace from God in the mystery of Christ. So in the Easter Vigil, uh, we have the procession of the neophytes from the font into the center of the community, which means they're coming into the promised land and the eschatological banquet. We go together to venerate the cross. Why? Together we are saved by that cross. We go together to receive communion and the the new instruction of the Missal makes a point of the procession of communion precisely because it's meant to remind us that we're not just going to communion individually, Jesus and me, but we're meant to communicate with the Lord and in the Lord by sharing with one another. That's why the, the parade, if you like, the procession to the place of, of nourishment and of communion is meant to be a common thing. And in small enough communities, the, the general instruction even recommends that everybody should stay standing throughout the communion procession until everyone has received. may not be practical in a huge group, but the experience is a very strong one of both common action and focused action towards the kingdom of the Lord.